Let's say a samurai is cutting rolled up mats at an angle with his sword. The next day, a daimyo or a yakuza boss or someone wants to know how good of a swordsman this guy is, so he has his men look through the trash, but the mats are all unrolled. Without re-rolling the mats, what angle did the swordsman cut? This problem is very similar to one that you've probably ran into at the grocery store. You're trying to find the best deal on toilet paper, but price per length is difficult to compare because every brand comes with a different number of rolls that are all a different radius with a different size tube and different perforation lengths, different thicknesses. So given a roll's radius, how much toilet paper do you get? I'll ask you one more question to get you thinking, and this scenario, unlike the other two, has some real published research behind it. You're an archaeologist, and you find a segment of a papyrus scroll that was damaged when it was still rolled up. How long is the rest of the scroll? The math behind all three of these problems is pretty much identical. You have some thin, flexible material that's rolled up, effectively a spiral, and the width is constant. It doesn't get thicker as you roll it, so this isn't a logarithmic spiral like a snail or a hurricane or a galaxy. It's an Archimedean spiral. In this video, we're going to solve these three problems and do an experiment to test our results. Let's start with the samurai problem. We'll pretend our rolled up mat is standing up along the z-axis, and the sword cuts into a perfect plane that increases along the x-axis. The cut makes an angle theta with the horizontal, and its center is a distance h from the bottom of the mat. We can see that the slope of this plane is tangent of theta, so the equation for the cut is z equals x tan theta plus h. We want to find where this plane intersects with the equation for the mat. I said before that the width of the mat doesn't change. In other words, the distance from the center constantly increases as the angle increases. This is the definition of an Archimedean spiral in polar coordinates. r phi equals something times phi, where phi is the angle and r is the distance from the center. If the width of the mat is w, then that something is w over 2 pi, since 2 pi radians is one full rotation, and at that point the radius should increase by w. The spiral is much easier to express in 2D polar coordinates, usually things with some kind of radial symmetry r. The slice, on the other hand, is easier to do in Cartesian, so we need to convert this equation in terms of x to an equation in terms of r and phi. You can do this with some trigonometry, and we get a nice equation for z. Plug in our equation for the spiral, and you get the height of the mat in terms of what angle you've traveled out of the mat's center. This equation does indeed give us a shape, but it's not the shape of the mat. For the very simple reason that when the mat falls to the ground and unrolls, we don't get to measure the angle that each part used to be at. We measure the distance from an edge. So now we have a new goal. Find the distance along the spiral in terms of the angle passed through the spiral. This problem is not insanely difficult. In fact, it could be a homework problem in a high school calculus class. However, I want to talk about this problem for way longer than you want me to because, one, we need it for the toilet paper and papyrus problems, and two, it teaches what is, in my opinion, one of the most important skills in physics. I will reveal this later. We're going to solve the problem in three different ways, going from smartest to dumbest, and at the end, we'll see which one does the best. Method number one, find the arc length of the spiral. The distance of a very small segment of a curve in polar coordinates is given by the Pythagorean theorem. You just need to change in radius here, and the total radius times the angle to get this distance here. Rearrange, and you get the equation for arc length that you've seen in your calculus textbook. Plug in our equation for the mat, and you need to solve an unfortunate integral. Find in a table of integrals, or type it into Wolfram Alpha, and you get this absolutely heinous result. This is the length of an Archimedean spiral. Method number two. Find the arc length, but with an easier integral. The distance along the spiral is basically just the sum of all very small tangential segments of the spiral. Yes, there is a tiny bit of radial distance that the spiral is constantly gaining as well, but as you wind up the map more, those become smaller compared to the distance you're gaining in the other direction. So let's just ignore the radial component altogether. Now we get a very easy integral, and the answer is this. 
Method number three, pretend the spiral is many circles. Do no integrals. If the radial component is so much smaller than the tangential component, we might as well pretend that the radius never changes at all. Everyone knows the circumference of a circle, so let's just use that. You can treat each winding as a circle with its radius at the midpoint of the winding, then you add them all together. You end up needing the sum of all whole numbers from 1 to n, but that's easy too. You just add each big one to each small one, then multiply them all. Convert back from winding number to angle, and you have your answer. We have three answers from our three methods, so let's see which one seems right. First we'll notice that method 2 and 3 differ only by a term of phi. I think it's safe to just ignore this. The majority of the length comes from the outside windings of the mat since they're longer, so if we're going to ignore any terms, they should be the ones that are smaller when phi is bigger. Phi squared grows faster than phi, so just erase this. These two methods gave us the same result. Next we'll compare that to method number one. Like I said, this is a pretty ugly equation, but we can take comfort in the fact that hyperbolic arc sine grows very slowly. So slowly compared to whatever this is, that it's almost surely safe to ignore it. Then we have to deal with this one. Remember that we're measuring the angle in radians. 2 pi radians is 360 degrees, and our mat is rolled many times. By the time we get to, say, the 50th winding, we're looking at an angle of 314 radians. But then it's squared, so this is 98,596. Adding 1 to that does almost nothing. So, again, we can just ignore this. Ignoring the 1 and the hyperbolic arc sign, the answer from method number 1 is exactly the same as method number 2 and 3. If you don't believe that it's a good approximation, just look at a plot. When you zoom in, there is a little bit of a difference, but that difference becomes insignificant as the angle increases. In fact, if you remember that we're trying to measure an angle from a mat, it becomes really clear that the error of our ruler is going to be bigger than any error from making this approximation. So I think there's a lesson to be learned here. Doing more work does not necessarily get you a better answer. In fact, in many cases, it gives you a worse answer. One of the main reasons that we do math problems is to understand patterns, and if our patterns are full of stuff, then the real part, the important part, becomes obscured. When there are high-order terms that are insignificant compared to other ones, then just ignore them. If you really needed the extra precision that all that math would give you, then you would use a computer instead. Computers can handle the numbers, that's what they're made for. You should worry about the patterns. I could rant about this for a long time, but first let's finish our samurai problem. Now that we have this beautiful equation for the length of the spiral, we can invert it and plug it back into our equation for z. At a first glance, it might not be too pretty, but it makes a lot of sense if you take it apart. What we have is a sine wave that has been shifted up, that has been rescaled on the horizontal axis into a square root, so the waves get farther apart as you move outward on the mat. The envelope of this sine wave is also a square root, which corresponds to the fact that the waves get taller as we move to the outside of the cut angle. This all makes intuitive sense, so let's do an experiment to see how well our model fits our observations. I wound up this piece of foam, cut it around 45 degrees, and then unwound it and took a picture. I used a ruler in the picture to estimate the pixels per inch, and then ran the image through an edge detector, and converted the pixels to xy coordinates. Then I entered our equation and found the parameters that fit the image best. You can tell visually that it fits the data pretty well. There seems to be some discrepancy near the edges, but that looks like it's more due to the camera's perspective distortion than of the approximations we made. According to the fit from our equation, the foam should be about 2 millimeters thick and the cut angle should be about 40 degrees. Both of these predictions are consistent with the actual measurements. I'll admit this method's estimate of the cut angle is not very precise because of the way the error propagates. I was only able to get it within 6 degrees or so, but at least our error estimate reflects this. In all honesty, if the daimyo's men really wanted to know what angle the swordsman cut at for some reason, they would probably be better off measuring the tiny angle that you can see along the mat's thickness. But if all you had was an image, or if this were paper or something else really thin, 
then it's good to know that this method at least works. I won't walk you through the toilet paper problem because the solution is really just in the arc length. If you want it written out formally, you can do it yourself. The papyrus problem is interesting though, so let's see how we can apply our results to it. Here's the scenario. An archaeologist finds fragments of a scroll that have some damage marks at regular intervals. It's apparent that the reason this pattern is repeating is because the damage happened while the scroll was still rolled. Maybe a worm ate through the layers. That means that the pattern gets slightly shorter each time, because the inner windings must have a smaller circumference. Using the damage marks, we want to estimate the remaining length of the scroll. It should be clear that this is basically the same problem as our sword cutting. We can go back to the integral we used to get the length of the mat and adjust the bounds so that we find the length of just the nth winding. Then when you calculate the n plus 1th winding minus the nth winding, you can see that it's always the same, n does not matter. The difference in length between two adjacent damage points will always be the same. Not only that, but 2 pi w should look a little bit familiar. This is the circumference of a circle with radius w, the width of the papyrus. If you have any closed loop, then another that's a constant distance away from the first, then all the extra parts in the outer loop make up a 360 degree turn, so they add up to the circumference of a circle. You can plug the width back into our length equation from earlier, and this is the total remaining length of the scroll. I would like to tell you that this result has helped archaeologists make new, groundbreaking discoveries, but that would be dishonest. It really hasn't. Estimates of scroll length have been made with this method, but a few years ago a review paper found that the error estimates are far too generous. Because it's objective to measure where the damaged points are, and because paper is rarely wrapped with perfect tightness, and because many archaeologists are using distorted images of scrolls, and because of the way error propagates through our equations, estimations made with this technique are extremely inaccurate. It's more useful as a fun math problem than as a way of arguing that a scroll contained or didn't contain something. 